Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this oddly scheduled Thursday. That is a Monday. I'm glad that enough people were able to uh, avoid schedule conflicts. Uh, I'm Jacob Levy, coordinator of the Research Group on Constitutional Studies, welcoming you to this year in the Research Group on Constitutional Studies lecture series. The first year that we've been able to properly begin the lecture series when it ought to begin in the fall and come together in real life the way we ought to be in all too many years now. I begin by acknowledging that McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples, including, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. The Research Group on Constitutional Studies brings together scholars at all levels from across McGill, undergraduates, master's students, PhD students, postdocs, and faculty, from a number of faculties and departments, all sharing interests in the study of the values, institutions, and norms that fundamentally govern societies. The RGCS lecture series, which is nearly as old as RGCS itself, is organized around the idea that we might bring leading researchers from around the world in political theory and adjacent and multidisciplinary fields of inquiry, philosophy, the social sciences, law, and history, to come talk about their research on the values, institutions, and norms governing free societies in a way that is broadly accessible to our large uh, student population who is able to and interested in hearing serious research presented on those subjects, trying to overcome the traditional sharp distinction between the communication of research and the communication of ideas in a student accessible way. We aim to bring excellent researchers who are also excellent teachers and our speakers consistently rise to the occasion. The Lynn Center the Yan P. Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds, of which RGCS is a part, is a university span, spanning center in humanistic social, social inquiry, including research groups on global justice, global antiquities in ancient history, uh, transitions in global modernity in modern history, democracy, space, and technology, a research group that is centered in the School of Architecture in the Faculty of Engineering, and a newly established research group last year on ethical issues in advanced computing. If you're interested in more information about the Lynn Center's activities writ large, um, they are available online at mcgill.ca slash Lynn hyphen center. RGCS's activities uh, are available on both Facebook and on the web at mcgill.ca slash rgcs. The lecture series will continue in an unusually rapid fashion next week when we will welcome Jonathan Rodden from Stanford University. And in the winter semester, we anticipate having RGCS lectures from Asha Rangapa of Yale University Law and Public Policy, Daniel Zablat from the Harvard University Department of Government, and David Schmitz of the University of Arizona Department of Philosophy. For today, and to begin our sessions for this year, I'm very pleased to welcome Sharon Krause. Sharon Krause, not yet. <laughs> Sharon Krause is one of the most talented and creative political theorists of her generation, um, writing a series of books and influential and important articles challenging for the sake of reconstructing liberal political and moral theory, aiming to establish foundations for liberal and democratic citizenship that take seriously the sources of moral motivation in a way that both traditional utilitarian and traditional neo-Kantian theories had neglected to do, and that takes seriously the fact of being liberal democratic citizens together in a world filled with other people whose freedom and equality we must also respect. She is the William R. Keenan Jr. University Professor of Political Science at Brown University. 
She is the author of Liberalism with Honor, a book drawing on Montesquieu to talk about the kinds of moral motivations that must animate liberal and democratic citizens willing to stand up for and defend their values. Civil Passions, Moral Sentiment and Democratic Deliberation, a book drawing primarily on David Hume in order to offer a moral psychology of what it is like to engage and deliberate over political questions together in a way that takes seriously our emotions and our passions and not only, though also not to the inclusion of, appeals to our reason. And most recently, Freedom Beyond Sovereignty, uh, a book drawing in substantial part on the work of Hannah Arendt in order to engage with the question of what it is like to be a free person in a world that is filled and populated with other free persons whose agency impacts our agency in ways that we must respect. Civil Passions was awarded the Alexander George Book Award for the best book in political psychology from the International Society of Political Psychology and was awarded one of the two most prestigious prizes in political theory, uh, the Spitz Prize from the Conference for the Study of Political Thought. At the time of the awarding of the Spitz Prize, I believe that Professor Crassie was the youngest winner ever to receive that award, which is ordinarily handed out to people at career highlights that come much later in life. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Sharon Krause. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you need me to have the mic? Shall I use the yeah. mic? Okay. Uh, yes. All right. Um, thanks, Jacob. Thanks uh, for the invitation and for the very warm welcome. Thanks to all of you for turning out on this rainy day. It's just really a delight to be here with you in person, together in the same room. So I'm going to talk about um, figures as Jacob was introducing me. I was realizing that this talk in some ways brings together my first book, Montesquieu, and my last book um, with a lot of Arendt in it. And I'm going to talk about Montesquieu, Arendt, and the Constitutio Libertatis. Um, Hannah Arendt once said that Montesquieu was to the American Revolution what Rousseau was to the French one meaning a kind of a muse or a, a, a kind of a guiding light. Arendt was a bit of a Montesquieu file, and one of the things that she was most drawn to in Montesquieu was his conception of power, what it is and, and how it works. Arendt had a similar way of thinking about power, and the way they both understood it challenges some common assumptions about power today and productively push us to think a bit differently about power, including power at what you might call the macro scale, uh, the structural level, global uh, networks of politics, economy, and society, but also power at the individual level, meaning our power, or at the micro scale, our, our power as individuals. So that really is my main theme for today, the account of power that comes out of Montesquieu and Arendt. But there's a third protagonist in this story because, as it turns out, the most interesting things that Arendt had to say about Montesquieu come in the context of her reflections on the American Revolution and the Constitution that followed. Arendt said that the most important thing the American founders and men of the Revolution took from Montesquieu was his distinctive conception of power. She called this conception of power Montesquieu's great discovery. And she said that the foundation of the republic in America was largely inspired by it. Montesquieu's discovery about power, according to Arendt, was that power is not so much a possession, as in something that one person or group has and wields over others, but that power is a relational phenomenon. Power is an emergent property of intersubjective relations, or what Montesquieu called rapport. From this perspective, an institutional framework that distributes influence across people and groups if it properly relates them to each other. An institutional framework like that 
could invigorate and sustain political power uh, as much as constrain it. In fact, when compared to a government based on a singular undivided authority, a political sovereign that has the right kind of relationality uh, and plurality could be a more effective, uh, could be more effective and more durable and not just more limited. So this way of thinking uh, about power challenged traditional views of political sovereignty, which emphasized the rule of a unitary will, whether individual or collective, and equated singularity with strength. Think of Hobbes here or later Rousseau. According to Arendt, Montesquieu's relational theory of power dissolved sovereignty in that sense, and she thought that the Americans had followed suit, and she thought that this was a really good thing. The sovereignty of political bodies, she said, is an illusion, and a dangerous illusion, because its insistence on singularity, on the unity of the ruling will, this insistence on singularity opposed what Arendt called the human condition of plurality, and it undermined freedom. And so she believed that the greatest American innovation in politics, as she put it, was the consistent abolition of sovereignty within the body politic of the republic. She thought that Montesquieu had provided the key to what she called the entirely new power center that the American system established. And she characterized this new formation of power as a constitutio libertatis, or foundation of freedom. Well, Arendt was partly right um, about that and partly wrong, and, and that's what I'm going to argue. Um, Montesquieu did develop a relational model of power, and this model is consistent in certain ways with Arendt's own understanding of power. And it resonates, too, with the conception of power that we find in the Federalist Papers. The relational composition of power looks somewhat different in the American Republic than it did in Montesquieu's old regimes. Uh, but in neither case is power associated with the exercise of a unitary will, again, whether individual or collective. So on this point, the three protagonists of my story um, are in agreement. And what they have to say about the nature of power is important. But there are also some differences among them, and the differences are instructive, too. For one thing, Montesquieu and the Americans didn't reject the notion of sovereignty the way Arendt did. They also had a different understanding of the relationship between power and freedom than Arendt, and a different understanding of freedom itself. And while there's a lot to learn from Arendt's reading of Montesquieu and the Federalist on the nature of power, on these other issues, on the relationship between power and freedom, on the meaning of freedom. On these issues, Arendt's views are not so compelling, or at least they're partial and incomplete. Um, they need to be corrected and supplemented by insights that we can get from Montesquieu and the Federalist. OK, so that's where we're going. Um, I'm going to talk first about Montesquieu's relational theory of power as it emerges in his major work, The Spirit of the Laws, published first in 1748. And I'm going to talk about how Arendt's conception of power can help illuminate Montesquieu. And when I talk about Arendt, I'm going to be drawing mainly from The Human Condition and On Revolution, books published in 1958 and 1963, respectively, just to kind of give you a lay of the land. And then I'm going to say something about the nature of power in the Federalist Papers. And I'm going to talk about how the Federalist conception of power resonates with the relational views of Montesquieu and Arendt. And finally, I'll talk about the relationship between power and freedom. And I'm going to argue with Montesquieu and the Federalist and against Arendt that power and freedom are different things, that freedom uh, is itself a plural phenomenon and that the relational nature of power is a reason to rethink political sovereignty, but not to reject it. So I'm going to be moving back and forth between the 18th century and the mid-20th century. Uh, but at the very end, I'm going to vault us into our century, um, into the present moment, and say something very briefly about um, the relevance of all this for democracy today. Because I think there are some valuable lessons um, in it for us as we try to navigate today's very complex constellations of power in the context of problems like climate change or global inequality uh, or rising authoritarianism. Montesquieu and Arendt and the Federalist 
have some important insights for us. And I'll go for 55 minutes or so, and then I'll, I'll stop. OK, so first, uh, Montesquieu's relational theory of power. Montesquieu believed in the need for a strong central authority in politics, but he also knew that a government that's strong enough to secure its subjects or citizens will also be strong enough to threaten their security. So both efficacy and constraint in the political sovereign are crucial. And both depend on a sovereign marked by internal plurality and by right relations among the sovereign's plural parts. In fact, Montesquieu shows power itself to emerge out of such relations, rather than being the internal possession of a unitary authority, as on more traditional models of political sovereignty. Again, think of Hobbes and later Rousseau. So I, I refer to this way of conceiving power as relational, and I draw that language from Montesquieu's repeated invocation of the relations or rapport between the different social groups and parts of government and other sources of influence that contribute to the composition of political power. I mean to capture not only the plurality and distribution of powers, and not simply their interdependence, but the fact that power arises through the rapport or relations among its component parts. This relational conception of power um, it comes out most explicitly in Montesquieu's accounts of the regime of monarchy and the Constitution of England. So I'm going to talk about those, uh, I'm going to talk about each of those um, a little bit now. So the spirit of the laws begins, more or less begins, with the typology of regimes. And according to this typology, monarchy is defined as a government in which one alone governs, but governs on the basis of fundamental laws. So not willy-nilly, not on the basis of arbitrary will, um, but on the basis of law. And the force of law in monarchy is sustained through an array of what Monte Montesquieu calls political bodies or intermediary powers. Um, and he describes these bodies as being the essence of monarchy. If you haven't read Montesquieu, but you have read Tocqueville maybe, maybe you've read Democracy in America, you might think of these intermediary bodies as old regime, pre-democratic forms of civil associations. But in contrast to what we see in Tocqueville, the intermediary bodies here are not voluntary associations, and they're not composed of equal democratic citizens. Instead, they're associated with the different estates or established social orders uh, and groups that composed French society before the revolution. Okay, so Montesquieu mentions both the nobility and the clergy in this connection, but there's a special emphasis on the nobility. In fact, the fundamental maxim of monarchy, he says, is no monarch, no nobility. No nobility, no monarch. Instead, one has a despot. Despotism is the rule of one person without the constraints of fundamental laws, just on the basis of arbitrary will, the whims of the prince. So the presence of these intermediary bodies, which sustains the rule of law or protects fundamental laws, this makes the difference between monarchy and despotism. In fact, Montesquieu says that the intermediary bodies constitute the nature of monarchical government. Now, maybe because he knew this claim could sound threatening to monarchs, he softens it a little bit by saying that in monarchy, the prince is the source of all political and civil power, and that the political bodies are not the prince's equals, but are subordinate and dependent. But still, it's clear that at least some of the intermediary bodies that constitute monarchy and are essential to its nature are actually independent of the prince. Montesquieu speaks of this independence specifically in connection with the clergy, who he says are a power that can check arbitrary power in monarchy and thereby provide a good barrier to despotism. But this reference to the independence of the clergy is part of a more general account in Book 2, Chapter 4 of The Spirit of the Laws, an account of how all the intermediary bodies affect the ways that, as Montesquieu puts it, the ways that power flows in monarchy. The role of the clergy in checking the prince is matched by that of the nobility. And in the course of that chapter, Montesquieu runs them together, saying that if you abolish the prerogatives of the lords, the clergy, the nobility, and the towns in a monarchy, you soon will have a popular state, or rather a despotic one. 
So the explicitly articulated independence of the clergy implicitly applies to the other political bodies too. The nobility and the clergy, the depository of laws, even the law itself, all embody influence that exceeds the power of the crown. Exceeds not in the sense of being superior to the crown, but in the sense of not being simply reducible to it. There's a clear plurality of powers here. Now, on the one hand, this plurality embodies Montesquieu's famous principle of a separation of powers, um, separation or balance of powers, which is intended to be a constraint on government and which he sees as necessary to freedom. Political liberty, he says, is found only in moderate governments and is present only when power is not abused. And then he goes on to say that to prevent the abuse of power, it's necessary that power checks power by the arrangement of things. In other words, he says, you need to combine powers to regulate them, to temper them, to make them act, to give one power a ballast that puts it in a position to resist the others. The privileges and the rights of the nobility and of the clergy and monarchy give them ballast or make them ballasts that enable them to resist the encroaching power of the monarch, just as the sea, Montesquieu says, which seems to want to cover all the earth is stopped by the grasses and the smallest rocks on its shore, so monarchs, whose power seems boundless, are checked by the obstacles presented by the intermediary bodies. Power can check power in this way only when there are plural powers in play. So the plurality of power produces constraint. That's the familiar side of Montesquieu. A less familiar side is that the intermediary bodies also help to affect the sovereign's power, to compose or constitute it. For example, although the monarch has the right, had the right to make laws, uh, royal decrees didn't have the force of law and couldn't take effect until they were formally registered by the regional parliaments. Likewise, intermediary powers in the form of local mayors and magistrates were charged with the enforcement and the adjudication of the laws. Without the contributions of these bodies, the prince could will a law, but couldn't bring it to fruition. A monarch's ability to make things happen, Montesquieu saw, rests on a complex set of others and on the rapport or relations among them, all of which exceed the monarch's own will. Then too, Montesquieu thought that the parliament's right of remonstrance, that was their right to reject a law proposed by the king, or, or at least to insist on modifications. This right of remonstrance and their role as an independent depository of laws, Montesquieu thought these things actually enhanced the legitimacy of the sovereign's authority in the eyes of the people. In fact, he says that the bodies that are the depository of the laws never obey better than when they drag their feet. And in doing that, bring into the affairs of the prince more reflectiveness, a reflectiveness that he says one can scarcely expect from the prince alone and his court. By enlightening the prince's will, the intermediary bodies help to sustain, he says, the trust of the people, and this secures their obedience. So the legitimacy that arises through the rapport between the prince and the intermediary bodies enhances political power also by increasing its durability. So power in monarchy arises from a layered, iterative process through which the prince's will is taken up by others and in turn responds to them. Um, it's an assemblage, in that sense, of these plural and interdependent, although not equal, forces. Their interactions enable the one who rules to make things happen and to sustain his efficacy over time all of which implies, as the Montesquieu scholar Catherine Lerrer has said, that the power of the political sovereign can only rely on other already existing powers. Without them, the sovereign's power is nil, because for Montesquieu, as Lerrer puts it, one is never powerful alone. So while monarchy is a regime in which, as Montesquieu puts it, one alone governs, um, uh, this one, um, the power of this one turns out to be an assemblage that includes multiple functions carried out by different agents interacting with one another. This power is constrained but also effectuated and conserved by its inner plurality and the relational flow of influence among its parts. We see this same or a similar relational perspective in Montesquieu's uh, influential depiction of the English Constitution. 
As he presents it, the Constitution of England divides political power according to the three main functions of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, and it largely places these different functions in the hands of distinct persons and social groups. For instance, the legislative function, he said, is entrusted both to the body of the nobles and to the body that will be chosen to represent the people. It's a bicameral legislator, right? Legislature, the two houses of parliament, um, are tied to different estates. The executive function, he says, placed in the hands of a monarch. The judicial function left to persons drawn from the body of the people. This plurality of sites and sources of power resembles monarchy, although here the different parts uh, stand on equal footing relative to one another. There's no clear hierarchy among them. This English, English assemblage includes institutional mechanisms designed to balance and connect its plural powers, relating them to one another in ways that foster efficacy and constraint both. For instance, the king can't enact laws directly, but has the right to veto laws made by the parliament. This involvement in legislation, Montesquieu says, enables him to, the king, to defend himself. It also sets constraints on the power of the legislature because Montesquieu says, if the executive power does not have the right to check the enterprises of the legislative body, the legislature will be despotic because it will be able to give itself all the power it can imagine. So by balancing the different powers, the English constitution on Montesquieu's account helps sustain the power of the political sovereign as a, as a whole. In this balanced, heterogeneous whole, no one part has the ability to overwhelm the others. And the three powers, Montesquieu says, are forced to act in concert to make things happen. And like the relational power of the political sovereign in monarchy, this one simultaneously constrains, effectuates, and preserves political power through its carefully constructed flows of influence. The careful construction of these flows is crucial. Montesquieu characterizes the right plurality of powers as, uh, or of parts, as a masterpiece of legislation that chance rarely produces. In contrast, he says, despotism leaps to view because it's so uniform throughout. Political power and despotism is neither constrained by the rule of law nor checked by political institutions that distribute and balance power. Now, it might seem that the singularity of the ruling will in despotism would enhance the power of this government. But no, Montesquieu's despots call to mind more than anything else the panicky tyrant of Plato's Republic. You might think of Book Nine in the Republic and the miserable life of the tyrant that's depicted there, whose power, although it's you know, without any formal checks or constraints, nevertheless is tenuous, insecure, the tyrant always living in fear, afraid of losing his grip on things, perpetually on the edge of impotence. Political power and despotism lacks the support of reliable institutional flows of influence that come with a more pluralized political sovereign. What's interesting here is that the composition of a despot's power like all power, is a function of how his initiatives interact with the responses of others. What makes despotism tend toward impotence is that the plural sources of influence that sustain the power of the sovereign are not well ordered and institutionally established, but instead are subject almost entirely to chance and circumstance. For example, a despot's power depends on his army, which keeps the people in fear, and on the visors or lieutenants um, and other subordinates charged with carrying out his commands. But the army, Montesquieu says, is dangerous to the prince himself because it can always turn against him, which makes him perpetually vulnerable to the very force that sustains his power. Likewise, his lieutenants are always on the verge of betraying him, in part because their own positions are so precarious. The fact that everything is subject to the arbitrary will of the prince means that um, his subordinates are radically insecure, and this incentivizes them to look out for themselves. Despotism cannot be sustained, Montesquieu says, without having hands to exercise its injustices. But he goes on to say, in despotism, it's impossible for these hands not to be employed on their own behalf. Then too, in the absence of fundamental laws, the succession of the empire cannot be fixed. And this makes conflict over the succession common and generates instability to the point where 
the prince is always in danger of becoming, as Montesquieu says, the first prisoner of the palace. The despot's power also depends on the people themselves, whose submissiveness has its limits, and whose resistance, when it comes, dissolves the prince's efficacy. Finally, the power of the despot rests on how his initiatives interact with the vast array of environmental conditions that together comprise what Montesquieu refers to as the spirit of the laws. A sovereign who acts in opposition to his people's mores and culture, their religion, their economic system, their legal traditions, a sovereign like that will be unable over time to make things happen as he intends because his power rests in a constitutive way on the existing flows of influence that are found in these rapports. So even for despots, power is a relational phenomenon. But because the flows of influence that compose the sovereign's power in this context lack durable institutional form, they're continually on the verge of, of drying up or running in a new direction. They're unreliable. The undivided and unlimited nature of rule in this regime is more a weakness than a strength. And that's, I think, one of the normative lessons that Montesquieu wants us to take from his analysis of how power operates, a kind of a warning to would-be despots that they would do better to, uh, to allow a plurality of powers and even to institutionalize that plurality rather than insisting on trying to impose their own will on everyone else in a unitary, unconstrained, or arbitrary way. That doesn't actually work, Montesquieu suggests, because that's not how power operates. It's not what power is. Power isn't just the exercise of someone's will, even a despot's. OK, so now I want to bring Arendt in, because Arendt's way of thinking about power is, is helpful here. Like Montesquieu, she distinguishes power from will. And she cites Montesquieu in making that distinction. In contrast to mere will, power is the capacity to actually make things happen in the world. <laughs> it has real efficacy. Power emerges, Arendt says, only where the I will and the I can coincide. And the I can, meaning the efficacy of any particular willed initiative, the I can depends in part on how other people respond to and take up your initiatives. For Arendt, political action, which is the foundation of power, political action occurs, she says, in two different stages. Action's first stage, she says, is a beginning or an initiative by which something new comes into the world. Some particular person begins or initiates an effort, an enterprise, an endeavor. The second stage of action consists in the response to this initiative by other people, their uptake of it, how they, as Arendt says, how they carry through whatever the one who initiated the action had started. OK, so to make this a little bit more concrete, let's come back to monarchy in Montesquieu. There we see these different stages unfold as the prince issues a decree, the relevant parliament registers it, the local mayor enforces it, the courts adjudicate it, and the people obey it. The power of the political sovereign in this context arises through the interactions between the prince's initiative and the uptake of that initiative by the intermediary bodies and his subjects. Their uptake carries through, in our sense, carries through the prince's initiative and brings it to fruition in the world. It turns the I can, sorry, it turns the I will into an I can. In the absence of such rapport, there's only impotence. You see will, but no efficacy, and therefore no power. It's the same thing in Montesquieu's account of England. The power of the political sovereign is a function of the relational flows of influence among its plural parts. Power is a plural phenomenon in this sense, Whereas the will, and now I'm quoting Arendt again, the will, if it is to function at all, must indeed be one and indivisible. Arendt invokes Montesquieu again here, and she compares him to Rousseau. She says that Rousseau made the mistake of thinking, of equating power with will. And therefore, Rousseau could conceive of political power only in the strict image, I'm quoting Arendt now, only in the strict image of individual willpower. Rousseau, she says, argued against Montesquieu that power must be sovereign, that is, indivisible, 
because a divided will would be inconceivable. But Montesquieu knew better, according to Arendt, because he understood the difference between power and will, and he recognized that however unitary or individualized the will may be, power is always a plural, relational thing. Now, an important implication of the plural nature of power, according to Arendt, is that, as she puts it, power can be divided without decreasing it. And the interplay of powers with their checks and balances is even liable to generate more power. Again, she cites Montesquieu, saying that he knew that the principle of the separation of power not only provides a guarantee against the monopolization of power by one part of government, but actually provides a kind of a mechanism through which new power, I'm still quoting, through which new power is constantly generated. Now I'm not quoting anymore. Montesquieu saw that the division of power could support and not simply constrain power because he distinguished power from will and he grasped the intrinsically relational character of power. Montesquieu's relational theory of power then, and, and especially the idea that power's plurality can generate efficacy and durability as well as constraint, this is something that Arendt thought was often overlooked. And it's true, I think, that we do tend to associate the, uh, the idea of a separation of powers coming out of Montesquieu. We, we, we associate that idea with constraint mostly, the constraint that comes with a system of checks and balances between the three branches of government. But Arendt didn't overlook the other side of it, um, the power generating side. And she thought that the American founders didn't overlook that side either, but that they were actually inspired by it to create what she called the greatest American innovation in politics. The constitution they established, that Constitutio Libertatis, it embodied what they'd learned from Montesquieu, that divided power is not necessarily less power, that the plural relational nature of power can be a source of its strength, not just a limitation. This was important to the American founders, Arendt said, because they were facing a crisis of political power brought about by the weakness of the Articles of Government under the Articles of Confederation, a government described by the Federalist Papers as being greatly deficient and inadequate to the purpose it was intended to serve. The Articles of Confederation had led to what the Federalist calls the extreme depression of our national dignity, and it generated innumerable inconveniences from a lax and ill administration of government including actual insurrections and rebellions at home, as well as dangers from abroad. The emphasis throughout the Federalist on the importance of energy, what they call energy and efficacy in government, speaks to this concern. As Arendt puts it, what the founders were afraid of in practice had as much to do with impotence as with unchecked power. The distinctly Republican context of the American founding is an important departure from Montesquieu, um, the Republic envisioned by the Americans would derive, they said, all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people. Of course, they had an unjustifiably narrow conception of the great body of the people and excluded way too many. But the point here is that the balance of power in this government would have to involve mixing multiple instruments of popular power rather than mixing powers that derived from distinct socialist states, like king, nobility, clergy, commoners, and so on, as in Montesquieu's depictions of French monarchy and the Constitution of England. Still, as with Montesquieu and Arendt, the power of the political sovereign they envision is composed or constituted through its internal plurality. Arendt draws attention to the fact that, like her and like Montesquieu, the Federalist understands power in a way that distinguishes it from mere will. Power is the ability or faculty of doing a thing, says Hamilton in Federalist 33, including the ability to employ the means necessary to its ex execution. Power involves actually making things happen, not simply wishing for or even initiating enterprises, but bringing them to fruition. The trajectory of government under the Articles of Confederation had been one failed initiative after another, bringing into dramatic relief the distinction between power and will. And the founders understood too that the ability or faculty of doing a thing in politics was never a solo affair, but always depended on the interaction of multiple participants, 
as in the iterative process of initiative and uptake that we've seen in Montesquieu and Arendt. The Federalists can seize relational power in the new government in a two-dimensional way. On the one hand, there are the relations between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the federal government. On the other hand, there's the relation between the federal and the, and the state governments. Madison in Federalist 51 describes this two-dimensional relationality in terms of a balance that provides what he calls double security to the rights of the people, saying that the different governments will control each other at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. But control is only one side of the story. The other side, the side that Arendt emphasizes, is the energy that these relations generate. Much as the efficacy of the prince's power under monarchy depended on his decrees being registered by the parliaments and enforced by the mayors and adjudicated by the courts and so on, so that the power of the political sovereign as a whole was composed through the relations among those different parts, so the power of the American government would be a function of how the people's legislative and executive and judicial organs interacted with one another to make things happen. Consequently, while the balance of powers envisioned by the new constitution involves separation to some extent, it also entails a certain amount of involvement um, by each branch and the others. Madison cites Montesquieu uh, on England in this connection to support the idea that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments, he says, should be by no means totally separate and distinct from each other. And he points out that in Montesquieu's account of England, the executive magistrate forms an integral part of the legislative authority and has the power to appoint the members of the judiciary. Likewise, he says, the legislative department forms also a great constitutional council to the executive chief and is the sole depository of judicial power in cases of impeachment. In a similar way, the American constitution should allow the executive branch a veto over legislation, should empower the courts to pronounce legislative acts void if they contravene the Constitution, and should give the legislature the right to initiate articles of impeachment against the president and to participate with him in making laws. For the American founders, as for Montesquieu, the partial involvement of each branch of government in the others was intended, as the Federalists put it, to provide some practical security for each against the invasion of the others. This would not only keep each branch in its place, but also enhance the contribution that each one could make to the efficacy and energy of the system as a whole. By strengthening each part through the right relations between them, you strengthen the composite, thereby increasing its power. Giving each part a specified role in the others also facilitates the coordination among them that's needed to generate power as you know, this ability or faculty of actually doing a thing. The problem with the Articles of Confederation had been that its multiple parts were too separate, being, as the Federalists put it, 13 distinct sovereign wills. Their excessive separation had prevented the iterative process of initiative and uptake that generates power. It had instead, as I say, arrested all the wheels of the national government and brought them to an awful stand. Government under the Articles had multiplicity, you might say, but not the right kind of relationality. The new government would be different and more powerful because of the institutionalized relationality established by the Constitution. The federal government's, re government's relations with the states were also constitutive of this power. Hamilton insists in Federalist 45 that the state governments may be regarded as constituent and essential parts of the federal government. Uh, and that they're necessary to the composition of its power. This dependence of federal power on state power runs so deep, in fact, that Madison says in Federalist 14 that if the states were abolished, the general government would be compelled by the principle of self-preservation to reinstate them in their proper jurisdictions. So all this suggests that the American founders shared with Montesquieu's, sorry, shared Montesquieu's conviction and also Arendt's about the relational nature of political power. They all understood power as an intersubjective phenomenon, as something that emerges through the interactions of multiple participants whose initiatives and responses work in concert to make things happen. The Americans adapted the relational understanding of power to the novel conditions they faced in trying to establish a new Republican constitution or political order 
in the wake of a failed confederation. But the basic understanding of political power as um, internally plural and relational, rather than indivisible and unitary, this is similar. Now for Arendt, the plural relational nature of power makes it a, what she calls a non-sovereign phenomenon. For her, sovereign means indivisible. Power is the function of a singular unitary will, as she puts it, independent from others and eventually prevailing against them. By contrast, non-sovereign political power, she says, springs up between men when they act together, and so it incorporates many wills and intentions. Because the coordination of many wills and intentions is fraught with uncertainty, power as a non-sovereign phenomenon can arise only where law and political institutions exist to establish or stabilize uh, agreements, the agreements among participants that meld their many wills and intentions into a dynamic relational whole that can make things happen. So Arendt saw Montesquieu's theory of power as non-sovereign. And she characterized the Federalist view, too, as non-sovereign, saying that the greatest innovation of the Americans, an innovation inspired by Montesquieu, was what she called the consistent abolition of sovereignty within the body politic of the republic. And for her, this innovation put both of them, Montesquieu and the Federalist, firmly on the side of freedom. Because, as she puts it, freedom and sovereignty are so little identical that they cannot exist simultaneously. The unity of will that sovereignty supposedly entails requires the suppression of what Arendt calls the human condition of plurality, meaning the irreducible diversity of wills that follows from the fact that, as she famously said, it's men, not man, who inhabit the earth. Consequently, she says, if men wish to be free, it's precisely sovereignty they must renounce. Okay, now I want to shift again to think about whether she was right about this. Um, I don't think she was, or not exactly right, or not entirely right. I don't think that Montesquieu and the Federalists would have accepted her non-sovereign label, for one thing. They didn't reject the idea of sovereignty the way that Arendt did. Her concept of sovereignty is really quite narrow. It leaves out important aspects of the common meaning of the term, like legitimate authority and definitive control over a territory and a population. Montesquieu saw the power of the French and English governments as being very much sovereign in that sense, even though in both cases, power had a plural relational character. It wasn't unitary. For the Federalists, too, it mattered a lot that the new government should have sovereign control over the American territory and population, at least in the sense that no authority other than the people's duly elected representatives could legitimately claim to rule them. Their innovation, uh, like Montesquieu's, was to show the possibility of a plural political sovereign rather than a unitary one. Seen from this angle, the relational conception of power that we find in Montesquieu and the Federalists is not non-sovereign exactly, as Arendt insisted, but instead it's more of a distinctive way of thinking about what political sovereignty could be. So why did Arendt insist on this point? You know, why was she so attached to the abandonment of sovereignty? Um, and what can we learn from that? Um, I, I, I think this move reflects her commitment to freedom and her particular understanding of freedom and her understanding of the relationship between freedom and power, all of which I think we have reason to reject. Arendt equated power with freedom on the grounds that both consist, as she said, in the capacity to do. Only where the I will and the I can coincide does freedom come to pass. Okay? To the extent that power embodies the I can, because it means, as the Federalists put it, the ability of doing a thing. Power and freedom run together. And Arendt describes the two terms as being almost synonymous. In addition to equating power and freedom, Arendt defines political freedom in a very specific way, as participation in public affairs, or the activities of expressing, discussing, and deciding in politics. She criticizes what she calls 
the liberal view uh, of freedom that treats freedom in terms of the scope granted, as she puts it, to apparently non-political activities, including, she says, free economic enterprise or freedom of teaching, of religion, of cultural and intellectual activities. The liberal view implies, she says, that freedom begins where politics ends, and it identifies freedom with protections for the individual against the political community in the form of civil liberties and other rights. But such protections, she thinks, miss the actual content of freedom, which is political participation. No one, she says, no one could be called free without participating and having a share in public power. I think Montesquieu and the, Ameri uh, and the Federalist um, would have rejected both the identification of power with freedom in Arendt and also the narrow definition of freedom. Um, you know, Montesquieu definitely did not see freedom and power as being the same things. He identifies freedom not with power, but with protection from power. Political liberty, he says, is found only where power is not abused. In fact, he says explicitly that it's a mistake to equate power with freedom, even though he says it's a common mistake, especially in democracies, where he says the power of the people has often been confused with the liberty of the people. The Federalists, too, saw the freedom promised by the new Constitution as arising not simply or not only from the Constitution's ability to put power into the hands of the people as a collective, but equally from its ability to protect the people as individuals from the potential abuses of this, their own power. On the meaning of freedom, too, there's quite a bit of distance. It's true that Montesquieu's principle of balanced power implies that moderation in government and therefore liberty, that this requires activity um, in some form by some people, as for instance, when the nobility and the clergy act to resist encroachments by the crown and monarchy, or when the English House of Lords constrains an overzealous commons through its right of veto. And he thought more generally that people's attentiveness to the potential abuse of power by government is a form of political participation that's necessary for freedom. But for Montesquieu, freedom is more about protection from arbitrary power than about political participation as an end in itself. He doesn't make political participation the very content or the sole content of freedom in the way of Arendt. Instead, he explicitly defines political liberty as security, or at least the opinion one has of one's security. Um, nor, did, nor does the Federalist, I think, make political participation the sole or, or even the primary meaning of freedom. Even though the composition of power in the American Constitution, which sustains, supposedly sustains the freedom of citizens, even though this depends on the political activity of the people and their representatives in elections, in the, brand, in the um, um, counteracting ambitions of representatives uh, um, within the various branches of government, and in the public attentiveness to government that keeps it accountable, um, despite all that, political participation isn't really the main focus. And Arendt acknowledges this when she criticizes the American Constitution for what she calls its lost treasure, meaning its failure to embody as a regular feature of government and for all citizens the direct political participation that was exercised by the founders themselves. In particular, she laments what she calls the failure of the founders to incorporate the township and the town hall meeting in the Constitution. That is their shift away from direct democracy toward representative government. The Constitution, she says, provided a public space for freedom as participation only for the representatives of the people, not for the people themselves. Well, Montesquieu and the Federalist, I think we're right to say that freedom, or to suggest that freedom is not the same thing as power, and that it can't be reduced to political participation. Freedom and power are different phenomena, and political participation is just one part of freedom, one kind of freedom, an important kind of freedom, but not the whole of it. If we accept that, then we have reason to affirm against Arendt the value of political sovereignty as a definitive, legitimate authority in politics, albeit a plural and relational one. Because without sovereignty in that sense, it'd be hard to protect people in a reliable way from one another 
and to protect minority groups from majority factions. Power is of an encroaching nature, as the Federalist famously puts it, and Montesquieu strongly agreed. This is how Montesquieu states that point. Any man who has power tends to abuse it. He continues until he finds limits. Without a common authority that can set limits, that has the legitimacy and control to secure the rights of all, more powerful groups and individuals will just tend to impinge on the freedoms of others. Arendt wrote forcefully about the problems of tyranny and totalitarianism, but she was oddly inattentive to the encroaching nature of power itself and to the fact that the power of the people is not immune to this danger. It's true that political sovereigns, even relational Republican sovereigns, it's true that they're not always dependable in protecting people from arbitrary power, and true that they may themselves manifest arbitrary power. And so for that reason, the action in concert that Arendt championed has an important role to play in generating resistance to the abuse of power when it arises, whether that's by the state or otherwise. But we can have democratic sovereignty without tyranny. If sovereignty is rooted in a plural relational form of power that includes both internal institutional divisions and extra institutional mobilizations or activist resistance to the abuse of power. This plurality simultaneously impedes the abuse of power and provides channels of uptake that can sustain the efficacy and durability of legitimate power. So Arendt was right to draw attention to the relational conception of power um, that we see in Montesquieu and the Federalist, and right to defend it. This approach clarifies how power actually works, and it helps us see why the division and balance of power, if properly institutionalized, how this can generate energy and durability as well as constraint. But we should resist Arendt's um, rejection of political sovereignty and instead stick with Montesquieu and the Federalist, who used their relational conceptions of power to re-envision political sovereignty rather than reject it. And we should learn from them, too, about the difference between power and freedom and about the multiple meanings of freedom. Freedom isn't limited to sharing in power, but also includes being protected from arbitrary power. Freedom's a plural phenomenon in that sense, and freedom's plurality is itself worth protecting. Okay, now, by way of closing, I want to bring us back to our own time out of the 18th century and the mid-20th century and into our own moment um, with a very brief reflection on the relevance of all this for democracy today. And the point I want to highlight here is that the relational understanding of power can offer us some reassurance, we citizens of contemporary democracies, as we find ourselves confronted with forms of power and politics and economic life that often seem to be beyond our control, global markets, the surveillance state, surveillance capitalism, the fossil fuel economy, white supremacy, and on and on. What Montesquieu and Arendt and the Federalists show us is that all power is plural and relational in its composition. But this means that all power entails a certain fragility. The flows of influence that compose power are always vulnerable to being obstructed or redirected by the actions of its constituent parts. Even the large-scale structural forces that make so many of us feel dwarfed and helpless in the face of problems like climate change and global inequality and spreading authoritarianism, authoritarianism, even their power is an assemblage. Like all sources of power, these forces too are dependent on flows of influence among their composite parts, on the multitude of agents who contribute to the iterative process of initiative and uptake that enables them to make things happen. We need to remember that we are parts of those flows, that we have the ability to alter their trajectories, at least if we act, as Arendt rightly said, together. At the urgency, I'd like to series. The first question is reserved for a member of the research group on constitutional studies student fellowship. So I'll call on the first question. Shall marry. 
Thank you. And thank you for your really spectacular talk. I couldn't help but wonder about the individual when we talk about the plurality of powers. And when you end on the note of acting together, I wonder if there isn't a demand on the individual to act. And so more broadly speaking, what is demanded of the individual participant who wields the power as a member of this plurality of powers? And does it demand perhaps a conception of citizenship, for instance, to then participate in the exercising of a power which an individual perceives themselves to have? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, Montesquieu, I mean, I want to think about this in connection with, especially Montesquieu and Arendt, maybe. Um, Montesquieu is very interested, committed to individual freedom, so he's attentive to the individual as an individual in that sense. But um, he really thinks about it, um, individuals as members of groups. And so the kind of plurality of powers for Montesquieu is, is more a plurality of groups than a plurality of individuals. And, um, and I think uh, something similar is true for Arendt too. You know, she says political power arises only when men act together. And the moment they disperse, when people come together, and the moment they disperse, power dissolves. Um, so I think what this suggests in relation to the specific question you've asked is that you know if if you're an individual citizen and you want to know what is kind of how should i be orienting myself relative to power in this particular political community join a group um and it, you know in in the groups that montesquieu had in mind mostly were groups that you were would have found yourself in um but for us and for Arendt too, you know, um, the, 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 we're mostly the groups that um, that are kind of sites or sources for mobilization, the kinds of mobilization that are generative of power, are things that we decide to join. And I think um, what this suggests is that, um, you know, the, the that there is a kind of obligation on the part of democratic citizens um, to not just be attentive and responsive to um, the abuse of power when it arises. I mean, that is a real and important obligation, but also to be attentive um, to how, you know, to, to, to where one is positioned in the plural groups that are parts of composing power in your in other words to be attentive to the place we hold and the role we play in prevailing relations of power um, to take responsibility for that and uh and to be attentive to it yeah does that it does that get it the question you're asking yeah okay floor's open david love Thanks again for a great talk. Is there such a thing as too many intermediary powers? Uh, too much process, too much foot dragging? What are the dangers of that, especially in popular governments, perhaps? And if you grant that, what is the language we should use in political philosophy for good and bad interrelational plural design? Are there certain systems of institutions that are more inclined to fall victim to obstructionism? And are there designs that are better, that keep things flowing? So for instance, the separation of not just powers, but the functions of powers. Mm -hmm. I can certainly imagine um, that there could be too many um, parts. Um, uh, yeah, you know, um, I mean, Montesquieu definitely talks about you know, the importance of getting the right mix, the right balance, the right composition. Um, and presumably that would include the right number. Um, but they also have to be oriented and related in the right kinds of ways so that you get this kind of sweet spot of a mix of constraint and efficacy, or in the Federalist terms, energy, you know. 
Um, and you know what the details of that are in any particular case. I mean, I'm, a, I'm enough of a Montesquieuian to think that that's probably going to be different in different contexts and that maybe there isn't a single uniform rule that could you know, work everywhere. Um, but I guess a general prin principle that you would be looking for is, does this particular mix generate the combination of constraint and efficacy? It, is, are there too many parts? Are they not ordered? Are they ordered in such a way that they're undermining efficacy? That's, I think, kind of the worry that you have. Um, but you know, remember that the, um, this Montesquieu's analysis of despotism suggests, and I, you know, I'd be interested what, in what people think about this if they have counterexamples, but um, that, that, an, that, a, that an authority that's too unitary, you know, that seeks efficiency by reducing the, its plurality, um, is not actually making itself stronger or more efficacious over the long term. It's depriving itself of the kind of um, framework or, or scaffolding um, that's necessary to be effective over the longer term. So you don't want to be too minimal, you don't want to go too minimal either. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so I have a, this is a question about the, this notion of plurality. Um, so I think there are, at least uh, what I understood, I think there are like, two layers or two levels of plurality. Like one is in the, um, like plurality uh, conceived in the governmental level, like the state level, like within the state, it seems like there is a plurality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is also another like level of plurality that's uh, like between individuals or like within society. It seems like to me like, um, so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really sure like, um, like what are those rel the, the relationship between those two levels of plurality, um, so to speak? Because um, I think there is a potential tension there because the reason why we want the plurality in the state level, um, as far as understood, is to attain, uh, to achieve the, the legitimacy of, of the government. I don't know whether that's my misunderstanding or not. But I think that kind of, uh, that justify the status quo. And if the society, in the society there is lack of plurality, you know, the, the having the plurality uh, within the state will uh, make this con make the societal condition of unplurality more um, justifiable. Um, I, sorry, like so. So I guess I guess uh, going back to like my initial question, like, uh, making a simpler form, like what is the relationship between the um, there's two levels of plurality, if there are, like... There are two levels of plurality, and it's a really good way to put it. I'm glad you raised this question, because I, I mentioned just really briefly in talking about despotism that there's also another source of, of a sovereign's power is the sources of influence that are found in the kind of very broad social environment that Montesquieu refers to as the spirit of the laws. The spirit of the laws is like the, the kind of the, the, the heart of a society, the kind of mind of a the spirit of a society that's embodied in its manners and mores, its habits of the heart, its economic um, system, its religious um, beliefs and values, its legal system. This, um, the, um, and Montesquieu, you know, the spirit of the laws is a study of all of these different aspects of society in lots of different places and, and across time. And, um, and so the, um, these, the, uh, uh, as I said, in connection with despotism, you know, a sovereign that, um, that tries to, a, a, a government that tries to exercise power in a way that's at odds with, in conflict with the mores and manners of the people, their religious sensibilities, you know, their economic system or whatever values, um, is, is going to find that his or her power is, is limited. It's like that, that you're going to come up against limits that way. And that's because 
those are also sites of influence that um, that uh, that affect and help to shape the power of the political sovereign of the government, um, uh, and that's a different kind. That's happening. That's operating. It's a kind of plurality in terms of sources and sites of power. That, that's happening at a different level than what's happening inside the government, whether it's monarchy um, in France or in the English, you know, system. Um, so what's the relationship between those two things, and is there a tension between them? I'm not sure I see a necessary tension between the idea that, there would, that there's plurality within the kind of system or structure of a government, and also plurality at this more you know, social level or extra-governmental, extra-institutional level. Do you want to follow up and say more about the tension that you're seeing? No, I need to. Maybe I need to think more about that. But uh, but I get. I I I. I'll maybe I'll ask you after the. After the yeah. Break. Okay. Let it resonate a little bit. Yeah, and see, yeah. Let, germinate. Let, let Let me maybe try a moment of translation here. Yeah. Um, you you foreshadowed Tocqueville a little bit in talking about Montesquieu mm -hmm. and it's talked about plurality in Tocqueville as vesting in associational life within the populace. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Montesquieu, still thinking about the orders and the states, um, it matters for the weight of the people, that the people are relatively unitary, standing potentially against other estates mm -hmm. as such. Is there a fragmentation as we move from the third estate to the world of Tocquevillian associations. Uh, that means that the translation from Montesquieu to Tocqueville isn't going to be quite seamless, and the kind mm -hmm. of uh, plural power that constitutes legitimate authority at time one in Montesquieu uh, isn't going to carry over because civil associations, voluntary associations, aren't part of the structure. Am I? Am I Getting I think, the I think, direction yeah. that you're yes 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 it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah. um, but still the voluntary associations are sites for the consolidation of power across individuals right that's their that's what they do and. Um, you know, government initiatives that cut against, you know, active voluntary associations are going to run into trouble, right? Um, so, so government initiatives that take seriously the views of the people as articulated, consolidated through voluntary associations. Um, those initiatives will tend to get the kind of uptake that's needed to bring their initiatives to fruition and to fully compose their power, to make their power power instead of just will and initiative. And um, yeah, I'm st I mean, does that uh, speak that, to this that issue? To me like an answer to my version of the question. Yee, does that sound like an uh, answer to you to your version? <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, but thank you for the uh, curious. Uh, okay. uh, I had one quick question about Montesquieu. Um, so um, I liked how you drew the relation of conception of power was already in Montesquieu, uh, but I was wondering whether all the evidences was concentrated on this discussion of monarchy and not the other forms of the government. What about republic? Um, is the power coming? And resonating in the uh, uh, circulating in the republic already a relational power. Um, yeah, I I guess I think that for Montesquieu, that the power in a republic would actually be a kind of like what Arendt <laughs> describes, and in, in the the power of the coming together of the citizens. Um, and it's that there's, but you know, the thing that, that Montesquieu 
didn't like, was critical of in ancient republics was that that power was, it was, it was plural in the sense that, that it was composed of the citizens as distinct people, but it wasn't institutionally divided or balanced. It was too, um, you know, it was direct a much, too direct and, uh, and not mediated. There weren't the, there wasn't the a kind of presence of intermediary bodies of, you know, when he talks about um, the kind of, um, um, the, the, what, a, a system that forces the different parts of the sovereign, the different sides um, to accommodate one another, to, to, to contest, to, to argue, to, but, but also to, um, to, to come to some agreement, you know, to, um, to contend with others. And that, that kind of internal division is, was, much as you thought was just not adequately developed in ancient republics. And um, so yeah, power is still plural there, but it has a different, it's not, for Montesquieu, it's not, it doesn't get, that, get to that sweet spot of efficacy and constraint that produces reliable moderation or produces moderation in a reliable way and protects individual liberty in a reliable way. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. So the big question is where uh, in a contemporary landscape of political theory do you place Montesquieu's theory of power? So just to say a little bit more about how I arrived at the question. So take it that Rousseau is wrong to equate power with the will, um, and Arendt is wrong to equate power with freedom. It seems like among the three concepts that we have, power, freedom, and the will, we want an account of each of those such that there's no like necessary entailment relation between each other, right? Um, and it seems like, at least on one account I'm thinking of, like a neo-republican account of freedom as non-domination, you can get just that, right? Because you can say that, well, you know, even though the benevolent master is letting me exercise my will, um, I'm not actually free, right? And even though I have power to do certain things and actualize my ends, um, I'm not actually free, right? So the neo-republican account of freedom as non-domination is like a way to keep those things distinct. And I'm seeing like remnants of that running through here in the way you're situating Montesquieu, but I'm also uh, not a reader of Montesquieu and uh, mm -hmm. don't have much uh, uh, knowledge about that. So I'm wondering where in the contemporary landscape of political theory do you situate Montesquieu's theory of power? Is it like similar or dissimilar from this neo-republican conception of freedom as non-domination? Um, how much to what extent? Yeah, okay, great question. Um, th I think there's a lot of affinity between how Montesquieu understands, um, well, at least how he understands freedom. And, you know, at least some of the neo-republican, you know, Pettit's version of non-domination, I think it's as protection from arbitrary power. And you know, I think that that's very resonant with Montesquieu. You know, there are other neo-Republicans that are much more participatory, you know, that insist on m more participation as part of the content of freedom. Coming out of the, um, more of the Arendtian strand of neo-Republicans, that's what I'm thinking of. And so there, I think, you know, there's somewhat less affinity, although not, not none. Um, because uh, I don't think Montesquieu thought that political participation was irrelevant to freedom or that it was a bad idea or anything like that. Um, but there's another figure on the contemporary scene in, in connection with power that's Foucault, right? And, you know, it's, I've thought a little bit about, you know, how, how, how Foucaultian Montesquieu's understanding of plural power is. And, I, you know, I'm not sure. If people have thoughts on this, I would really like to hear them. Um, on the one hand, you know, one of Foucault's big insights is to, to, or contributions is to push us to not think about power in the state only, but to think about power, you know, outside the state. But Montesquieu really is thinking about the state. He's, you know, he's also thinking about the spirit of the laws as sorts and sites of power, sites of power. But really, his concern is with power in the state and trying to understand how that works and how you can manage it and constrain it, you know. Um, so there is that difference. I think also Montesquieu, there isn't, you know, the idea of power, the, the kind of 
um, the, the, the activities that were the process of subjectivation in Foucault where you know, the disciplinary effects of power as they're internalized and taken up by subjects. To, um, I, that's not, I don't see that in Montesquieu so much. I mean, he thought that despotism, you know, as a kind of regime of domination affected people's souls. He would have described, you know, he talks about it like that. Um, but it's not, it's, that's, it's really not Foucault. But there is another aspect of it, which is, um, that, you know, as Foucault has been developed by, by later figures, um, by people who have kind of taken on Foucault's understanding of power and then thought about how people might re-inhabit prevailing relations of power and redirect them or reconstitute them. Judith Butler, for instance, or uh, Bill Connolly or, or Ron Coles, these are all people thinking about how you could inhabit prevailing relations of power differently and create new flows of power, counterflows and so on. And I think there's a, quite a bit of affinity that, on that idea with Montesquieu. And that's, I think, one of the things I want us to take from his relational theory of power is to think of ourselves as parts of flows that we have a place that we have some um, ability to affect and to re-inhabit and to redirect. Look, yes. Um, so first off, thank you for the talk. Um, I kind of have a, a question that kind of touches on the context. Um, so we're super interested in kind of the retrieval of like the federalist and Montesquieu's conception of um, a preconditions or the effective exercise of sovereignty being all these partial, or the plurality of powers. Um, and I'm wondering if today what we're seeing is not that the plurality of powers is a precondition for the effective exercise of sovereignty and power, um, but something that obstructs um, the exercise of power. So just to take like a limit case, um, the recent like Supreme Court of the US decision to um, curtail the ability of the EPA uh, mm -hmm. to reduce like climate emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder, I, I guess it's just a question for the contemporary context and um, is this inability, you know, it, it seems like we have the I will, but we don't have the I can for a lot of these kind of intractable like, global mm -hmm. political issues. Um, is this um, something about you know, the particular arrangements of contemporary states like the US Constitution yeah, yeah, it, it's a great question. It's a really hard question. Um, I mean, so it is the problem that there's too many plural powers, or is it the pr is the problem that what we're seeing is the increasing consolidation of fewer power, you know, fewer, bigger powers. And um, I think that maybe the second thing is more true. And if that's true, if, if it's more that we're seeing the consolidation of power more than the proliferation of multiple, too many sites, then, um, then that suggests that, you know, part of turning the eye will into an I can might be, you know, might have to involve reconstituting. Yeah. And this comes back to your original question about what should we do as citizens, you know? And it does seem to me that this picture suggests that, you know, we can't really do much by ourselves. And so, and, um, so that, that but, but maybe, you know, an objective and maybe a kind of democratic obligation of our time is to constitute, new, reconstitute, newly constitute, um, you know, associational, institutional forms that can, um, that can consolidate power enough to challenge the really big consolidations of power. Um, that can, you know, like working on creating assemblages that can do some of that work. And resisting also within government, resisting the, um, the abandonment of 
um, powers by particular branches of government, you know? Um, yeah, okay, great question. Last yeah. question, Will Roberts. <laughs> so, thank you for this talk. I, uh, you touched on something that has always kind of, I've always been curious about and wondered about. So, I'm just going to ask you to clarify my own thinking for me. So, uh, <laughs> because it's sometimes hard, there, there's this bit in Aristotle, which you, and Plato, you, you mentioned Plato in this regard. So, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of appeal, there's a sort of appeal to this, a certain sort of long term self interest of the ruler that says, well, in fact, um, you know, the tyrant uh, in Plato or in Aristotle will be better off if they become more like a monarch, right? They'll be, they actually gain from, mm -hmm. uh, they gain stability, they gain security in their power from bringing more people in um, and ceasing to um, try to monopolize everything themselves. And there's a, that element is in Montesquieu. That was, that was part of the, the, the thing you were talking about at the beginning about the, the monarchy and the difference between the monarch and monarchy and despotism. But I wonder, like, I feel like the time scale changes between uh, Plato and Aristotle, between the ancients and Montesquieu, and I wonder what that does to this calculation. Because if if a monarchy gets more is more powerful insofar as uh, power is shared with these other political bodies. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the given monarch is more powerful, right? Like the given monarch, the king might have to give up some ability to do the things that he wants to do right now mm -hmm. for the sake of the stability of the monarchy as, a, as an institutionalized mm -hmm. um, sort of thing. So, I just wonder if that playoff on time scale, um, I wonder if there's something a little bit Whiggish about thinking that we can appeal to the sort of self-interest of the powerful and say, look, you'll be more powerful or power will be increased if mm -hmm. you, you know, share it, if, you, if it is instituted, if it's also limited for you. I, just, I wonder about I wonder about that, and so I was just wondering if you would uh, share your thoughts with that. Yeah, I see what I see what you're saying, and I I think you know, I mean Montesquieu, he 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 had to be attentive to the sensibilities of monarchs, and um, yeah, I guess you know. So one one thing you could say is well maybe maybe this was a kind of a like a noble lie in on Montesquieu's part like it's it's not really maybe it's not completely altogether true that you you know will tyrant will are going to do better in the short term but it's better if you think that that's the case and I'm going to try to convince you of that um, it's better for you know it's better for the rest of us at least it's better for every if you think that um, you know, on the other hand, I, I, I also think that Montesquieu, you know, really did, he really objected to arbitrary power and, and to, you know, the idea that, that a ruler, that it would be okay or, you know, respectable or legitimate for a ruler to do just what was in his own interest right now. And so part of the idea of monarchy is that monar you know, is that monarchy is, it, it, it has an ideal, it, it aspires to glory, you know, on Montesquieu's account, there, that it's bigger than the individual person. Um, and, you know, I mean, he, Montesquieu thought that the sense of honor um, uh, on the part of particularly of the nobility, the sense of honor was a real thing. The people that would really motivate people to, you know, do what they thought was right and what their code demanded. And he says that, you know, he, he thinks that in a, in a real monarchy that's not a despotism, but a real monarchy, that, that, that there's a sense of that on the part of the ruler too, a kind of investment in 
aspiration to make the thing great, you know? Um, so, it, so insofar as there's an appeal by Montesquieu to the sensibilities of rulers, I think, you know, he, I think it's not, I don't think it was just a noble lie. I think there was something um, authentic or sincere, too, about making that argument. But, you know, what you say, I mean, the, is, is actually true, that it's, it's very often not in the short-term interest of anyone who has more or less unlimited power to allow limits on that power. And that's, um, I'm not sure that, there, that there's a solution to that problem in Montesquieu. And, I, I, and I, I, I accept your kind of, your objection or your suggestion that what Montesquieu offers to deal with that problem is not fully adequate. You know, it's, it's not enough. Stick around for a second while I do the concluding business. <laughs> um, first bit of concluding business, uh, I'd like to thank the Yankee Lin Center, supported by a generous gift to McGill from Dr. Yankee Lin, PhD class of 1992, uh, for its support for RGCS and the lecture series. And would also like to thank the Institute for Liberal Studies for a grant that partly supports the lecture studies this year. Uh, we're going to give away a copy of Professor Grassley's book. Uh, Freedom Beyond Sovereignty, my favorite of her books, um, uh, from among the students who registered to attend. Seven mod two is uh, 14. Uh, Abby Coote. Abby? Uh, and while she does, I'll say uh, after we conclude, Please join us in the adjoining ballroom for our reception. Uh, I hope to see everyone back here this time next week for Jonathan Broden from Stanford University giving a lecture on political geography, uh, polarization, and representation. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who are going to, who are on the list for dinner, please be ready to leave the reception together in groups at 6:45, and we'll make our way. And with that. Please join me in giving a very warm thank you to Professor Perry. Thank you. Thank you.